Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 50. We're so glad to have you join us here this week. This is a special episode where we're going to take a look back at our top 50 board games of all time. That is until something else cool comes along and then we have to kind of rearrange the list again. Unfortunately, Drew and Anthony are not here with us this week. They moonlight with Santa during the season to ensure that all the good board game boys and girls get only the best games. So join Daniel and I as we go through our top 50 board games of all time. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Daniel. After the last episode, people were shouting, you guys got to come back, you got to do one more. I know it's a stress, you know. I know everybody else wants to jump on the podcast, but if you two guys could come back, that would be awesome. Yeah, and I mean, it's a big job for only two men because our fans will know this. This is our 50th episode. Woohoo! Yeah, so that's that's a pretty big deal for us here, and so we've got something special in store for you today. Chris, why don't you tell them what we got for them? So we got to 50 episodes. We wanted to do a, a special podcast for you. This week we thought about our top 50 games. Which one ranks 1, which ranks 50... You know, if there's something that is not on this list that you think that should be there, let us know because we're happy to play something new and review it for the podcast. Yeah, I mean, so this is our top 50 games, not yours. This is our (laughs) top 50 games. But we would love to hear yours, right? So if you have just individual games you'd like to suggest or if you want to give us your whole top 50, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Check us out on Board Game Geek. We have a Facebook page. We have a website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, and you can pick up our... All the podcasts there, all the blog articles, all our news articles really have great content on our website. I know many people sometimes when they, like the podcast is talking about a website, usually go there and it's just a podcast. This is a fully functioning website. It has a lot of material. Drew puts a lot of stuff up there. Anthony keeps it nice and sharp. Yeah, because we're just too awesome for any reasonably length podcast. To try to capture all that, it would it would take days. It would literally take days. We've got to be multimedia with our awesomeness. <laughs> what we're going to talk about in this episode is kind of the top 50 games and you know where they fit in our placement in our lives and how we've enjoyed these games and hopefully how you'll enjoy these games. So if you haven't heard about these games before or haven't had the opportunity to sit down and play them yet... We would highly, highly recommend playing them. Yeah, these are 50 games to play before you die. Absolutely. So while we do kind of lean towards the the lower numbers being better, you know, as you get closer to number one, any of these 50 games will offer you a great time. Now on to Board Gamers Anonymous Top 50 Games for 2014. Let's talk about number 50. 50. Our number 50 game is Ticket to Ride. Choo, choo. I'm just making sound effects right Sound now, effects guys. are awesome, man. And actually, the what's one of the fun things about Ticket to Ride is you can get the Ticket to Ride app, mm-hmm. and it has that little choo-choo sound every time you, every time you add a train to it. So that's, a, that's actually a lot of fun. Ticket to Ride is a classic game. You all probably know about it, but if you haven't played it before, you're picking up train cards in order to build routes. And then you'll have these cards which say you have to build a route from, let's say, Los Angeles to San Antonio, and you'll score points on that. It's simple, it's easy, it's Days of Wonders, kind of cash cow. It's just recently came out with a 10th anniversary box set, which is beautiful. So Ticket to Ride plays with everybody, and it's something you should definitely check out. Yeah, and this is one of those few games that has had such a profound impact on the gaming community as a whole that pretty much everyone knows it. And I do think it's clear that Ticket to Ride has been a major contributor to the hobby and is one of the reasons that we're able to have a community so active as to have podcasts and review sites and all of that. If it weren't for them, we probably wouldn't be here. Absolutely. Well, our thanks to Alan Moon on that. Yep. All right. Our number 49, San Juan. I love San Juan. This game is one of my favorite games I've ever played, and it was one of the first games I played with a board game group, right? People who I didn't already know. Uh, And we sat down together, we played through this game. I was a bit intimidated, you know, because there's all these games going around with kits and pieces and markers. I'm pretty sure there was a four-way 
combat of mage wars going on in the background, and anyone who's ever seen that knows that that's an intimidating thing to see. Uh, but someone sat me down and played San Juan. It's simple, it's easy, it's fun, and it showed me how elegant game design can be, right? There is one number that matters. Every number refers to the exact same thing, the number of cards. How beautiful that is, how elegant that is. It is it is so smooth, so clean, and manages to be very fun and engaging while having essentially one mechanic. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea that there's just a single deck of cards, and it acts as the buildings and the currency, I mean, it seems kind of obvious now, but it's revolutionized gaming. And it's a solid game for a deck of cards. This is clearly a game you can sit down, you can play, you can have fun with. Everyone enjoys it. And there's been, you know, spinoffs, you know, based upon this card mechanic. And it's just, it's, it's really a great game. Yeah, and for those of you who, like myself, really want this game and were heartbroken at finding out that it was sold out, Ravensburger Game is coming out with a second edition of San Juan. So look for that uh, and look forward to that because San Juan is fantastic. All right, now on to our number 48, Love Letter. Um, uh, I don't have a sound effect for Love Letter. <laughs> Aww. Aww. <laughs> so Love Letter is another brilliant small card game. It's a micro game. It's really the micro game. You know, since Love Letter came out, everyone's been trying to replicate it. Just take a look at Kickstarter and every game is a micro game. And honestly, they're not. Love Letter is the micro game. Because it's the smallest deck of cards I've come across that has so much flavor, so much activity. It's part of the Tempest universe. Everyone plays this game. To the point where now it's almost getting a little sickening because there is a version and a skin for practically everything you can imagine. There's there's a Batman one. (laughs) You know, there's, there's a Munchkin one. There's a Christmas one. There's a, you know, there's just, there's more and more and more. And, And by the time this podcast is over, there'll probably be another five. But it's it's a simply brilliant game, and it deserves every accolade it's gotten. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the first games I played with my girlfriend, May. Uh, and I think it's b- the game that convinced her that she could be interested in more serious gaming as a hobby. Uh, and it really is just so wonderful, so smooth, and so pleasant to play. And those, as you can tell, are big things for me, right? If it's a quick, smooth... Uh, efficient game and this is another one of those games that does that really well yeah absolutely brilliant design and it plays with non-gamers which you can't ask for anything more it turns non-gamers into gamers that's true all right right, so let's talk about our number 47 the resistance slash avalon now i don't know that works yeah it kind of (laughs) works like so with resistance it's it's a bit of a party game it's this hidden role mechanic where you'll get a role and both game and they're both on the same list, they're, you know, for the same number, which I tend not to like to do. But the games are identical. You know, the more recent update of the Resistance has the Merlin character in it. So basically, you're getting a role. You're the good guys, or you're the bad guys. And then there are missions, and then somebody will choose who goes out on the missions. Now, the good guys want all well, good guys on the missions, so they'll pass the missions. The bad guys want to fail the missions. Whoever has the majority at the end of past missions or failed missions wins the game and with the Merlin part which is pretty interesting is you know they have knowledge which they can try to communicate to the other players to not put that those people on the missions but at the same time there is an assassin and if the assassin which is part of the bad team kills Merlin chooses that character that that's Merlin uh the bad guys win so simple easy quick Honestly, it's going to become the party game that, you know, everyone knows eventually. Yeah, again, this is another fantastic game. I feel like I might need to stop saying that because it's going to be a truism for our top 50 games, right? Nothing on this is a game we don't think is fantastic, though we might have some personal disagreements about how fantastic. (laughs) Um, I actually remember Sherry from the uh, Myriad Games, where we used to play from the Staten Island Board Gamer Group. She sort of ran that event. She was telling me one of her favorite gaming stories involved this one, where they... uh, you, you get these little trader cards that tell you you're on the bad guys, and she gave one to everyone as a joke to see what would happen, and she said the <laughs> the ensuing confusion was fantastic. So there there's a home variant if you feel like being a little puckish. I hear that. I actually did that with a love letter game. If you get the, the original Japanese version, they give you multiple princesses, and I handed out the, the princess to everybody. So I just I saw everyone just going, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but your princess is in every castle? <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> quantum flux. State. Like I said, Love Letter has a version for everything, so this is the Mario version. Yeah, there you go. It's a million dollar idea. <laughs> All right, another favorite game, our number 46, Gravwell. Right, so this is one of my favorite games in existence. I'm sure you guys are getting tired of me uh, harping on this by now. Did you finally change your last name to Gravwell now? So? Almost. The, the papers are getting held up in court, but you know, we're working on it. Um, this is the single most creative racing game I've ever played. It is one of the few racing games I've ever enjoyed, and it is just incredibly well designed. Uh, it was the designer's first game, which is incredibly impressive to me, considering how smoothly it plays and how innovative the idea is. Uh, and it's going into a second printing now, so that's good news for everyone. I highly suggest you pick this up. It's a lot of fun. It looks quite intimidating when you first you know, see the game, and you try to work out the calculations in your head about you know, working with gravity or pushing against gravity and such. But it plays smooth, it plays simple, and it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, the only reason I was satisfied with it being this low on the ranking was because it is kind of a niche game, right? It's... Uh, a little bit complicated, a little bit more complicated than most racing games are, and it involves a little bit of sideways thinking, and it takes players a little bit of time to get used to that. Right? People are used to a much more straightforward sort of thing, but this is all very relative, right? The significance of your cards that you play depends upon the cards that other people play and their positions to one another, and it becomes very difficult to predict. Uh, so it can be a little slow for people to pick up sometimes. Our number 45 game, Alhambra. Now, Alhambra is a really interesting, you know, gateway game, especially for family and friends. But it does offer enough strategy that hardcore gamers will be interested in this. Basically, you are purchasing tiles to add to Alhambra. And some of the tiles have walls, so there are certain placements that work better than others. And then whoever has the majority of certain colors in each of the scoring rounds will score additional points. It's simple, it's sweet, it's got an enormous number of expansions to it, and generally it's a lot of fun. I know myself and Anthony really love this game, plays pretty much with everybody. Yeah, Alhambra, like Ticket to Ride, is one of these games where I'm not sure what we can say that hasn't been said before, because it is such a staple of the gaming world. I guess what we can really say here is it's a staple for a reason, right? It's a good game, it's fun, it's smooth, it's well-designed. Uh, I am repeating myself every one of these, but no. these are the standards by which we judge games, right? I think the one da- the one downfall with this is, for some reason, it has not gotten the wide appeal, wide press, wide wide marketing, like a Ticket to Ride or a Carcassonne. I actually like this better than Carcassonne, you yeah. know, and it's it's a little disappointing. I wish this game got out to more people. Yeah, it, it's a wonderful game. It's definitely something to pull out and put on the table if you haven't had the chance to do so already. Great. Our number 44 game, Boss Monster. Oh, I love Boss Monster. It's a fantastic game. I have a t-shirt that says Boss Monster, which Chris was very kind and gave to me after he won it. Uh, And uh, I I wear that shirt all the time. It's a lot of fun. I think it's a little bit low on this list because the expansion is what makes it so much better. It it, it plays good. It's an interesting game. It it has a lot of nostalgia to it. So if you're a video game fan from the 8-bit, 16-bit generation... This game is really going to come home to you. Basically, you're a boss monster, and your boss monster will have a special ability. And then your job is to build the dungeon, which are cards. And then as you build cards, they'll have certain treasures in them, which will attract certain heroes. You're trying to kill the heroes. Whoever collects most souls wins the game. The expansion gives you special items and relics and things where the heroes come in the, into the dungeon with those... And if you can knock them off, you'll get those. So it adds so much more to the game. It's a light, fun, interesting game. And something you should definitely check out. Now on to our number 43, Quantum. Uh, Quantum is another fantastic game. Uh, sort of an instant classic. You roll dice to determine the kind of ship you have in an area. And then you fight over resources. And very almost uh, standard space battle game. Except it's so... Uh, light, and again, I'm going to use that word efficient, right? It's one piece. The die does so much work here, right? It, it represents the ship, and you roll them to randomize effects, but wherever they land just represents a different kind of ship. Yes. Uh, and I think that's just fantastic. Our number 42, Cosmic Encounter. Now, what's really interesting about Cosmic Encounter is the special abilities of the aliens. When you play a sci-fi game, you live and die based upon 
how unique they can make this universe. It should be somewhat, you know, reasonable and interesting and something you can kind of grasp onto. But the aliens should look alien. The powers should be somewhat alien. And this game has a... It's a competitive game, but it has a co-op kind of mechanic to it. Because fate is going to decide, based upon this deck of cards, who you fight. And then you can call for allies, and the person you're attacking can call for defenders... And then everyone can commit ships, and then they have their powers, and you'll play cards, and there's attack cards of certain values. It has so much to it. It's a great game. You know, the aliens are just endless wonder. You can play with more than one at the same time, and the expansions have wrapped so many different elements to it. It's something well worth playing. It's a little bit lower on the list just because you really need to have you know, the right group for this game because there's some negotiation that goes on. Some people may or may not like that so much. Yeah, I mean, while Quantum is a great sci-fi battle game, Cosmic Encounter is the sci-fi space battle game, right? It, it defines the genre, essentially, and it's hard to overlook that. Our number 41, Conquest of Planet Earth with the expansion, Apocalypse. Now, talking about sci-fi games and finding something truly alien, how about aliens from the 1950s, 1960s, you know, B-movie kind of universe. So that, you know, those kind of really creepy, you know, plastic monsters where you were like, you kind of laughed at it. Conquest of Planet Earth has that. And you get to play the aliens taking over Earth. So once again, modular boards, you place out certain locations, the humans fight against you using armies, tanks, you know, ships and planes. And it's just, it's light, it's fun. It plays as a co-op or it plays as a competitive game. And it has that really unique, interesting artwork from Flying Frog Games. It does not get enough press, but it's a game that you should take a look at. Because if you like that you know, sci-fi time period, it might be something that's really interesting for you. Yeah, it's a nice stylistic callback to an earlier decade, an earlier uh, sort of subgenre of sci-fi, right? Uh, and it's nice to see that at the table. Number 40, Star Trek Fleet Captains. Now, I've heard of the criticisms about this game, and you're right. The components have their problems, they're thin, they're hero clicks that kind of give you an issue there here and there. But but there is not a game out there that is more thematic than Star Trek Fleet Captains. In particular because you get to play the unique ships from each of the different factions, and there's plenty of factions now. So you have the Federation, you have the Klingons, you have the Romulans, and you have the Dominion. So you get to play those ships. You get to play those ships with those special ship cards. You get to play... All of the crew, which is outstanding. Although I don't know why Captain Cisco is not there yet, guys. Come on, come on, was come on, was kids, come on, get 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 with it here. But beyond that, it has a really interesting mechanic because when you move your ship to an open hex, you get to roll a dice, and an encounter could take place. And when an encounter takes a place, and a card is shown, you will actually be playing the certain episode from Star Trek. So it's like, oh, I landed here, I rolled a dice. Uh Uh-oh, it turns out it's the triple episode. So I have to do certain system checks or do certain activities in order to score victory points. There is not a more thematic game, you know, in the sci-fi universe than Star Trek Fleet Captains. Yeah, there's very little more satisfying to the Trekkie than breaking out this game. Definitely. Number 39, Kingsburg. Now, Kingsburg is a worker placement game that uses dice. Which is fun, right? So you have this beautiful board of this medieval, slightly fantasy universe. And you're going to roll your dice to be able to see where you can place your influence over these different characters that are going to give you resources in which you can build buildings and then fend off whatever that evil horde that's coming in the winter is. The expansion makes this game so much better because it allows some asymmetry in the game. You get some special characters with some special abilities This is basically is the father of Alien Frontier. So if you've ever played Alien Frontier, you should take a step back and play Kingsburg. It plays a lot faster than Alien Frontiers. It's a lot less AP. It's a lot less downtime. And it's a lot of fun. Number 38, Shadowhunters. You know, Shadowhunters is this really interesting mix of a party game meets an Ameritrash game. So in this game, you're going to get a hidden roll. And you could be a shadow hunter or you could be one of these shadow creatures like a vampire or a werewolf or several other creatures. There are also neutral characters in this game that have their own win conditions. The shadows want to eliminate the shadow hunters. The shadow hunters want to eliminate the shadows. 
And there's a little bit of a deduction game. So you'll get these green cards that you'll pass out to people to see if the effects take place. They'll help you narrow down who's on your team. There are white cards that heal. There are black cards that hurt. And there's a little tiny board where you can kind of, you know, fight fight it out a little bit. It's a fun game. If you're going to play something that brings in a lot of people into a game, Shadowhunters is outstanding for that. Number 37, Dixit Journey. Now, I picked the Journey version of Dixit, although any of the Dixit versions really work well. But Journey's artwork was a little more... I don't know, realistic, a little more anime kind of thing, a little more sharp and clear. You know, there was something unique about that artwork there that really, really drew me in. Now, don't get me wrong, the original Dixit and Dixit 2 artwork was a lot more abstract, which probably leads to more interesting gameplay, whereas Journey is a little more, you know, obvious in in that type of way. But it's such a great departure from the original Dixit as far as artwork is concerned, it really kind of evokes so much feeling and emotion that when you play with Journey, people just can't help but smile or frown. It's just, it's really evocative, those cards, that artwork there. Yeah, I mean, the images there are very powerful. I think which version of Dixit you want to play is going to depend upon your personal aesthetic, right? Do you like more surrealist work? Do you like more realist work? Uh, but all of the Dixit games are fantastic. All of the Dixit games are creative, fun, and simple. I highly suggest you pick them up and play them. Number 36, Rivet Wars. Now, Rivet Wars is interesting. We talked about this several episodes ago because it's a miniature game that really kind of appeals to pretty much everybody. It has these little despicable me as the World War I army troops fighting, you know, the Allies versus the Axis. And it's kind of fun, you know. It's fun, it's simple, it's interesting. It has really unique pieces it has that steampunk universe type of look to it. It's got planes, it's got blimps, it's got tanks, it's got legally distinct <laughs> hero characters in the game. And it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, Rivet Wars is riveting. Ah, I think, I, think I might have used this pun too many times in recent episodes. Please <laughs> forgive me. Anyway, uh, and with the new Battle of Brighton expansion coming out, right, you're going to actually get those airborne troops, which they've been promising us since the beginning. And that promises to make this a really fantastic game. Number 35, Star Trek Attack Wing. Now, there's a lot of miniature games with the flypath system that we could put on this list. But for me, it's the Star Trek universe that really does it right. And the reason for that is you can put crew on your ship. Not just a pilot, but you can put a number of members on your ship. And typically, not always, but typically, it's not a pure he hits for one more damage or he has one more defense. But the cards are thematic. There is fluff on the cards. The artwork kind of speaks to you. And the flight pad system for me kind of fits better with that capital, you know, ship system where moving, you know, two to the left makes kind of sense. Where if you had a little quick ship, you really should be kind of zooming around a lot more. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of flight path games in general. And like yourself, I'm a more fan of Star Trek than the Star Wars Attack Wing. That's partially just because of my preferences between the properties and partially because I do like the idea of these giant ships which could blow, you know, kilometer-sized holes and planets uh, flying around and shooting at each other. I am interested to see how the Dungeons and Dragon attack wing, which just came out this last year, develops because that could be very promising with the role of ground troops and air troops, the uh, introduction of magic. Yes, exciting times. I think for you know the, the Star Trek version kind of fits in the middle. You know, the X wing miniatures is on the lighter side of it, where the pilot is attached to the ship, whereas the you know Dungeons and Dragons version is really a lot more complex. That might work. The models are definitely painted better. The attack wing ones are not so great on the paint jobs there. But just because of the theme and just because it fits so well with the flight path system, it makes our list. Yeah. Well, I just tried and true, right? It works. We know that. That's right. Number 34, Wiz War. Now, Wiz War is quite an interesting game because it's this true Ameritrash game. You get a wizard and everyone has the same type of wizard. You put them on your side of the board. You have a treasure to defend, and the object of the game is to have two treasures at the end or to kill everybody else. Then you get a deck of spell cards, and this is where the real the fun comes in, because the spells are pretty much everything you could possibly imagine from the entire D&D catalog of spells. So, you know, from elemental to bestial changes to necromancy, like anything you can imagine has been used in this game 
The artwork is outstanding. It's light. It's fun. It's simple. Go out right now and play it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Number 33, Munchkin. Now, I'm going to put all of Munchkin in this in this kind of box here. And I know, I know there's a, there's, there's a lot of hate for Munchkin. But if you sit down and you play Munchkin and you just enjoy the journey there, you're building a tableau of really interesting puns and jokes and great artwork by John Kovalec. It's so much fun. It plays everybody. There's a reason why it sells as much as it does. It brings non-gamers into the gamer world. I have many different versions of it. I'm proud to have them. They're a lot of fun. If you're concerned about the really big issue with Munchkin is that it plays too long, check out Apocalypse version because the Apocalypse version has these seal cards that when they open up and you hit the seventh seal, the game ends automatically. So that kind of solves some of that issue. Yeah, I've never really understood the Munchkin hate. It's a fun little game to me, but I guess I could see some people thinking it takes a long time. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, everyone rushes up to the end, and then there's a lot of playing of cards to stop those people. But the artwork is so humorous, so cute, so fun, so indicative of our gaming kind of history that I can't see why you wouldn't have fun with it. And if it's not the D&D version, there's literally a version for everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Number 32, Lords of Waterdeep. Now, Lords of Waterdeep is a, is also another interesting game. It's the Dungeons & Dragons universe but a Euro game. So you get to play a worker placement game, which is kind of different for your D&D players out there. And hopefully this game has brought you into the fold as far as a tabletop game is concerned. It's a little light. It's a little simple, but that's not bad. It's a good entry level game. If you're more of a hardcore gamer, I would highly recommend picking up the expansion because it adds some different elements to it. But, you know, this game hits the table. I have yet to see someone who's kind of turned it down. Yeah, it's a strange game in that it has a foot in two different, very different camps, right? It's both a worker placement and a D&D themed, and that is really not a combination I would have thought would be successful, but it is one of the classics in both of those genres, which is telling of its quality. I mean, it's a little challenging. You're going to be playing cubes at certain times. You're going to be like, oh, you have to play four orange cubes to you know finish this quest and stuff. But you know, pick up the D&D meeples and enjoy a great game. Number 31, Betrayal at the House on the Hill. Yeah, so you guys know how much I love this game if you've been listening. Uh, and if you haven't, you should know anyway. Uh, because <laughs> it's very important to me how wonderful this game is. It's one of the most creative and replayable games I've ever played. Right, The tile layout is uh, randomized every game, so the building you're exploring is new, always new. Uh, the event sequence is randomized, so... What happens to you after the haunt right, is, is almost always going to be new. There's 50-some-odd uh, unique uh, scenarios that can arise, sometimes putting players versus players, sometimes putting them against the, the game itself. Uh, and the fact that you never know who's going to turn on you, if anyone is, makes the cooperative phase of the game feel much more important and much more dangerous. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful game. I absolutely suggest everyone should play this game. I've racked my brain. I don't think there's any game like Betrayal because at some point, one of the players is going to get up and start messing with the group. So, you know, they go off and they read their book and you have your book and you try to figure out what to do and the game switches. So where you were collecting things and working together as a co-op game, now it's a it's quite of a competitive game. Yeah, it's got one of the best implemented trader mechanics in all of gaming. Number 30, Yurgasil. Now, this is an older game that's been out of print for quite some time. And typically, I don't like to include games that have been out of print. But this game is a very unique Norse mythology game in the cooperative universe. You can still pick up this game. And I would highly recommend picking this game up for your iPad. Because it has so much flavor. It has so much rich Norse mythology. It's not like, oh, there's Thor and Loki and that's the game. No, it has all of the Pantheon here. And it's just got so much flavor to it. You're trying to knock out the bad guys before they bring about Ragnarok. Yeah, Yggdrasil is very effective at capturing a theme that is too often left to the side. We've talked before about how many Viking games there are, <laughs> yeah. uh, but too rarely do they show the struggles of divine figures, right? Too rarely do we get to see into the mythos that informed those cultures, at least in some cases. Uh, and this game is a very interesting instance of that sort of cultural paradigm right that sort of mythological paradigm number 29 flashpoint fire rescue 
you. I'm just now figuring out that Chris motioned to me to begin talking, not to make a, a noise. But that's that's the start there. Uh, and that's the good. <laughs> that's the sign of any good fire team. Yeah. You know exactly what I'm saying without even saying it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue is, uh, for me, actually the definitive cooperative game. I know that's a little bit heretical, uh, but I think it has supplanted Pandemic. It is more flexible, more challenging, and more interesting. Right? You can adjust it in a lot of different ways, moving the difficulty up and down. It's appropriate for anyone from children to hardened veteran gamers because you can move the difficulty so smoothly. Uh, and the art is beautiful. The components are charming and charismatic in a way that Pandemic, let's face it, is not, right? They've got little cubes and static pictures of uh, a few locations, right? Geographic locations, whereas Flashpoint has these very well illustrated human faces, right? And you've got the little figurines you move around. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful game. Number 28, Battlestar Galactica. You know, typically when you see a TV board game, you should run screaming the other way because not only do you try and suck away your money, but pretty much most of your life, but Battlestar Galactica does everything right. It's so thematic. It has a traitor mechanic. So if you've watched the, you know, the more recent Battlestar Galactica show, and I don't want to kind of spoil anything for you, but... The really simple spoiler, which everyone should be aware of, is that some of those seemingly looking humans are actually Cylons. So in the game, you'll get a card and you could be human or you could be a Cylon, but yet you have to play out your role. So you're going to play secretly if you're the Cylon. And once again, it's another traitor mechanic and you're trying to ruin the missions and you're trying to stop, you know, the Galactica from getting home to Earth. It's fun. It's a long game which is not a bad thing because you're trying to figure out who the bad guy is in this game or with the later expansions you know you could be a Cylon leader and play both sides or have a special mission it's got great components great artwork it fits really well and it's something that uh, a good group of people if you can get the right group it would be a great game yeah, this is one of those games that does come with a bit of a caveat, though, which is it is very long, it is very substantial, and it is very group-dependent as to whether or not you'll ever be friends again. <laughs> uh, so keep that in mind, right? Make sure you have a good group when you bring this to the table, and more appropriate for a group of veteran gamers than it is for a newbie, uh, whereas some of the games we've talked about, Love Letter or Flashpoint, right? all those would be fine for newbies. This game is not newbie-friendly. Number 27, The Castles of Burgundy. Now, this is a classic... Stefan Feld game. So most of us, at least on the podcast, are pretty hardcore Euro gamers. And, you know, the Castles does something right, which basically is you are going to get points and you're going to get a lot of points and you're going to be picking up tiles to add to your little tableau and placing those tiles to, to kind of fill those spots and score those victory points. For me, you know, when I think Euro and if I wanted to show somebody what a Euro is, it's going to be Castles of Burgundy just because... It has that really clean, interesting, a little bit fiddly, but clean and interesting Feld mechanic that is tr- the true and blue Euro. Number 26, Mice and Mystics. Oh, I love Mice and Mystics. This is, this is such a wonderful game. It is playing through a storybook. It feels like Redwall plus a little bit more magic. Uh, and it is one of the best games at evoking a theme that I've ever played, right? There's the cat, which is unto a dark god, right? And when the cat hits the ground, you need to be running because you're not going to win that fight. Uh, There's humans will occasionally interact with you. And again, right, just you're outclassed because you're a mouse. Mice aren't going to win that fight. Uh, You slip through corners. You steal cheese, right? This is all so wonderfully thematic. And on top of that, they have expertly voice acted audio files you can download so that instead of having to read through the narrative yourself you can have this sort of play in the background and the first time i heard it i was kind of poking fun at it like oh ha ha i mean it actually starts out the whole like a story of like a an old mouse and a young mouse tell me a story papa and i was just going, oh this is going to be terrible and not 30 seconds into it i was going then what happened right they they caught me so well it's it's a wonderful game our number 25 is Cyclades. Uh. Uh. So Daniel okay. likes this game and he just can't express it without, you know, vocally hurling and throwing himself on the ground repeatedly. Bleeding internally. 
Uh, Cyclades and I uh, do not have the uh, best relationship, as you might remember from our matchup of uh, Kemet and Cyclades uh, not too long ago. Uh, Cyclades, I believe I said I'd rather be punched in the face than play this game again, and that's honestly kind of true. But Cyclades does have one of the most innovative auction mechanics I've ever seen, and it is popular. So this is one of those places where, as a reviewer, I kind of have to nod my head to the mass opinion and say, all right, I think this game is terrible. I gave it a burn, actually, right? I wanted to burn it. Um, But the majority of our listeners and the majority of game players out there seem to disagree with me for whatever mass delusion. And podcasters. (laughs) Oh, you know. Mass delusions can affect us all, Chris. Well, Daniel, you should know that Cyclades has a Titans expansion that supposedly improves gameplay, and hopefully in the future we'll review this. Oh, guys. Uh, If anyone wants to, like, tag in with me (laughs) for that week, just let me know, man. Listen, Listen, the fans want to hear it. Now, that being said, I do love Cyclades. The artwork is outstanding. The miniatures are great. It has a lot of fun to it. It really evokes that kind of Greek mythology in a way that no other game does. The auction mechanic for the gods' favors is very unique and very different and interesting. The expansion for with Hades kind of adds a little more gameplay, which kind of speeds things up. And the Titans expansion that's coming out should be a lot of fun because it changes the boards up. It adds more interaction. It adds different ways in which to win. And, you know... It might be a game that actually Daniel would want to play. Maybe possibly could be on an alternate universe in a different plane of existence on an alternate Thursday on a leap year. Well, anything is possible, Chris. <laughs> if you want to hear more about my hatred for this game, look back for our Cycladius Kimet versus uh, episode. That'd be, I think, in the 30s, 35. Uh, it was a pretty good episode, if I do say so myself. Number 24, Americo. Here's another excellent Stefan Feld game. And you probably know this game because it's got the cube tower drop. So to start this game off, you'll take all of the cubes of all the different colors and you'll throw them in the tower and they'll kind of funnel out and then you'll place the cubes around. And then throughout the game, you'll be picking up and dropping more and more cubes in there. And depending on the color of cubes that come out of the tower, it'll allow you to take that action that number of times. It's got a modular map, so you'll be able to build this kind of wondrous island board and it's a lot of fun. It's interesting. It's a Euro game. And if you like Euro games and you like big towers with dropping cubes in it, it's fun. Number 23, Kemet. Kemet is a game I really enjoy. It's one of my favorite games. And we did a Kemet versus Cyclades episode. And I loved Kemet. And I wanted to destroy Cyclades and those involved in its creation. Uh, <laughs> it really is the nice... The great thing about Kemet is the choice of powers and how you can kind of build a tableau of powers up. It has some artwork issues, it has some miniature issues, but it's a fun tactical war game. What's really interesting about Kemet is the opportunity to pick up different powers, put them together, see how they interact with your troops, kind of move them out, take over different temples, score victory points. Overall, a very fun game. Yeah, there are a lot of good strategies too, so there's a lot of ways you can play it, and that's always nice in a game like this, that there's no one true path, and all who stray from it shall be swept aside. There's a multitude of options available. Number 22, The Duke. The Duke is a small game. You might have seen this before. It's got a little tiny board. kind of looks like chess. It has these wooden little blocks. And on the blocks is the character that you're playing. Now, you'll move the characters based upon their movement pattern, which is also on the little block of wood, which is great. You don't have to look at a rule book. It's all there. But now here's the fun part. Once you take your movement... You flip the tile over, and then it has a whole second set of moves. So you have to do a little, a little memory kind of game there, because you have to memorize you know, what's going to happen once you move it to some other place. But it's, it's for such a small game, it replaces chess for me, and it's kind of got so many expansions to it, you really can kind of play with it for hours. Yeah, I mean, any game that can contain its rules on the board, I'm a fan of. Number 21, the DC Deck Builder game. And its really fun expansion, Heroes Unite. Yeah, DC Deck Builder is one of my favorite games, and it is the game that I think has gotten the single most play out of my entire collection. Uh, This game, when I would bring it to Myriad, when Myriad was still around, every week I brought it, it got pulled out. 
There was a while when I got sick of it, so I had to stop bringing it because I knew people would want to play it with me. There's a period of time when I got sick of it, so I had to stop bringing it to Myriad because I knew that everyone would want to play it as soon as I pulled it out. Uh, because it's that good of a game. I like the core game a lot, and I like Heroes Unite a lot. They're both really excellent uh, games, both standalone. And you can mix them together, though that's probably not advised, because there are a few mechanics that might get off kilter there. Um, and I think that the the early expansion, Heroes Unite, and the core game are a little bit better than the Crisis expansion, which I think lost some of its edge. Uh, and you can hear us talk about that in our Legendary versus uh, DC comparison uh, DC Crisis comparison, which was just a few episodes ago. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's, as I said, again and again and again, it's the potato chips of games. You drop it down, you pop it open, and it's so much fun. It's it's a really simple, easy deck builder that, while is not a heavy game, it benefits from not being a heavy game. Yeah, this is the second Cryptozoic game that it makes it into my list of favorites, this along with Gravwell. So they're doing something right over there. And just an honorable mention to the Lord of the Rings deck builder game, the Naruto deck builder game, the Street Fighter deck builder game. They're all pretty much the same type of game with a little difference here and a little difference there. You can check out one of our older verses, you know, the Street Fighter Row 1 versus the Naruto version. But it's fun no matter what flavor you go to with. Number 20, Smash Up. And it's endless numbers of expansions. Talking about flavors, oh boy, do we have flavors for you. Whatever combination you choose, whether it be chocolate and strawberry, or chocolate and potato chip, or chocolate and ketchup, like (laughs) anything you want to put together, Smash Up will let you put together. Number 19, The Lord of the Rings, the LCG. Now, there are a lot of LCGs out there, and in particular, I pulled out Lord of the Rings instead of the other ones because I think Lord of the Rings does something unique. It is a two-player game, but it's two players in a co-op type of version where you're fighting the darkness, right? So there's a darkness counter in this game that's counting down to try and stop you, and you'll actually get to play different kind of areas and missions and different characters from the vast number of of the Lord of the Rings universe. The artwork is outstanding. The component quality is really good. And it just fits right. When you pick up those expansion packs, don't get me wrong, Android, Netrunner, Star Wars, the card game are outstanding games. But this one, when you pick up a pack, you're going on an adventure. You're not just getting additional cards. So pick up whatever, you know, whatever little world, whatever little chapter of this book you're interested in, and you got a great adventure. Did you realize that you quoted almost word for word Bilbo Baggins leaving the Shire? I'm going on an adventure in the movies. Yes. Ah, there, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> Number 18, Tokaido. I love Tokaido. This is a fantastic game. Uh, here you play as uh, pilgrims along the Tokaido Highway uh, in times before it was as well developed as it is today. Uh, and your and your goal is to just have the best pilgrimage possible. And there is and there are a few things that appeal to me so powerfully and personally as just trying to have a good road trip, right? And it's such a powerfully simple game. The mechanics are all very straightforward, which I like. Uh, and it's so very charming, right? The entire time I was having a great time, even while I was getting totally destroyed by everyone else playing with me. Because it's hard to have a bad time when the metric of success is how good of a time are you having. Number 17, Citadels. Citadels! Now, Citadels is really interesting because it has so much game in a little tiny box. And we always love, as Daniel was saying, an efficient game with few components that does so much. So in this game, you are going to be picking a role, and the role has a special ability that plays out during the game, depending on the number. And then you're going to be building different buildings as part of the Citadel. Some of the buildings have special abilities, but the role cards are really what come into play. So if you're the assassin, you're going to take somebody out. If you're the thief, you're going to steal from somebody. If you're the warlord, you're going to destroy someone's building. If you're the bishop, you're going to be protected from that happening. So there's just a lot of different interesting roles here. And each round, you get to pick a new roll card. So a lot of fun. Really tiny box. Citadels. Number 16, Agricola. There are a few games that hold the kind of place that Agricola does in gaming. right? It is... It is the worker placement game, right? And it's one of these games like... And it's one of these games like Settlers of Catan, right? Where 
casual gamers will know about it and have it on their shelves, right? People who are not very involved in the hobby still know this game, still play this game, still love this game. Uh, and it's no surprise as to why, right? It's a good game. I remember when I first got into gaming and I heard about Agricola and they're like, it's a game about farming. I'm like, no. <laughs> I want to play space games and I want to play fantasy games and I don't want to go farming. Why are you making me farm? And somebody pulled this out and dragged me along, and I'm really glad they did because, as Daniel was saying, it's the quintessential worker placement game. You know, you are building a farm, providing for your family. You're getting a special deck of cards to start the game, which you can play as occupations or improvements. And, you know, it's really hard to put into words because it is a farming game, but it is a game that, it's a Euro game that has theme, which is unheard of. It does feel like you're planting because you have to, you know, prepare the ground. You have to plant and then you grow. And then when you grow, then you'll be able to, you know, reap this harvest and feed your family. You have to feed your family. Otherwise, they'll get, you know, negative points. And it's not, it's it's a lot of challenge in this game. And it's just so much fun. And really in particular, while there is a love and hate relationship with this game, that's really what makes Agricola so great because when you're playing it, you do feel so tight. If you don't make the right move, you're going to lose and lose badly. Yeah, Agricola is a stern teacher and it does not tolerate mistakes. It does not. <laughs> and I have never come closer to cutting someone than when they took the wood space <laughs> when I needed it in Agricola. And it, I did not expect to become that passionate about a game involving wheat. Honestly, you know, this game would have been off my list. I mean, it plays brilliantly, but it is that kind of really stressful feel that you when you're playing that game or when you accomplish the opportunity to feed your family. I fed my family this round. I didn't think I could do it. I got this and I got this and it chained together. I feel so happy. And you're like, well, I didn't realize it would feel that happy. But, you know, in the Agricola days, this was that hard. Yeah. In, in my advice for playing this game, set your own personal goals, just like life. <laughs> Don't compare yourself to others. Just be happy if you have enough, because it can be brutal. It's very brutal, but it's a lot of fun. Number 15, King of New York. Now, King of New York replaces King of Tokyo. Now, I know this is a little bit unheard of, and I own all of King of Tokyo, and I'm really glad about that, but King of New York really brings in that I'm a monster smashing buildings, I'm fighting planes, and then at certain times in the games, they fight back. The special powers in this game kind of snowball together a lot better. They're more thematic for the game. They have the same great artwork. You're able to move around the board, which you couldn't do in Tokyo. So this game is definitely an upgrade from King of Tokyo. Plays a lot of people. It's a great gateway game, and it has that Yahtzee mechanic. Yeah, just to echo this again, right? It's a fantastic game. You get that additional mechanic of destroying buildings and cars and dealing with fighter jets, which is great. Uh, you get some inter-monster competition that's a little bit more creative than the last game. And I think the biggest sign that they're using the game to its full potential that, in a way that they didn't in the past is that the 1, 2, and 3 side of the dice are now all replaced with sides that have unique effects. And that means a lot, right? That means they're really maximizing what they can get out of this game. Number 14, Revolution. I already used Viva la Revolution. I'm going to do it again. Viva la Revolution! <laughs> so we talked to Philip DeBerry, who was the creator of this game not too long ago on Kick in the Habit. And Revolution's a really fun game. It's a Steve Jackson game. But it's not Munchkin. It's an area control game where you're bidding for influence, you know, on certain locations in order to control that area. You're using blackmail, you're using gold, or using force. It's fun. It plays a lot of people. It's a good entry-level game. And it's now on its second expansion, so you can kind of mix the board up a little bit. It's just a solid, solid game. Number 13, Suburbia. Now, Suburbia is the Sim City that you've always been waiting for. The opportunity to place these tiles down that interact with each other in unique and interesting ways. It's once again one of those games that seems very highly complex and challenging and daunting because you look at the board and you're like, wow, all those hexes, how, how did you figure out to place those together? But it's got a really simple market mechanic. You're going to be purchasing something. It might have an additional market price added to it. Things chain together or they don't, but things can chain together from other people's boroughs as well. So... Light, fun, simple, but yet complex and challenging. 
Yeah, Suburbia, the only real complexity, or the only real difficulty for me came from keeping track of what's going on on the board, so that's a slight asterisk there, because as you get more players, you're having to keep track of a lot of stuff, but the game played a lot more smoothly and a lot uh, was a lot easier to learn than I thought it was going to be. Number 12, Castles of Mad King Ludwig. So Ted Alsback created Suburbia, and he also created this game. So you can tell just by looking at the game, this is definitely a visual upgrade, but it's also a upgrade to gameplay. So instead of just having this simple market where things kind of move down and then fall off, as the master builder, you'll be able to place the different rooms by whatever measure you feel is necessary. So if you think someone's going after a certain room for their castle, you can place it on the high end, hoping that they'll buy it and pay you the money. But you also have to be careful because if it's too expensive, they won't buy it. And you want to place your buildings where you can be able to purchase them. It's interesting and unique because you're going to make crazy floor plans with these pieces. Very colorful, very interesting. It's a brand new game and something you should definitely check out. Number 11, Glory to Rome. Now, Glory to Rome has one of those great mechanics, kind of like San Juan, where the card has multiple features to it. So you can use this card to bring in resources. You can use this card for its special ability. You can use this card for to be put in the vault for victory points at the end of the game or to be added as influence just so many different things to do with these cards that it takes san juan kind of to a, a second level it's a little more complex it's very hard to find because the original version is out of print they kickstarted a second black box version which is also out of print but if you ever see glory to rome out there you should absolutely check it out it's an outstanding Euro game using a lot of cards and depending on which version either very cartoony artwork or very kind of clip art kind of artwork so a little bit challenged there but it's a great game number 10 Dominaire now Dominaire is the second game in the Tempest universe on our list and why Dominaire is so interesting is because you take all of those characters from Love Letter and elsewhere and you're going to build a basically a tableau of all of these people that are working with you or under your control and then you'll be able to place influence on the board to control those areas kind of like revolution in a way now there's a exposure track so you don't want people to know too much that you're out there grabbing these powerful people for your use but at the same time you want to be able to control as many areas as possible and you get special abilities and benefits the gameplay is a little bit long and can be a little bit complex and a little AP prone, but if you can weather the storm, it's a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, Dominaire is one of the best political games out there, right? About political influence and sort of not quite diplomacy, but sort of getting your hooks into the population. I guess sort of Machiavellian political method, right? It's it's a great game for that purpose. All right, number nine, Sentinels of the Multiverse. Verse, 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 verse. <laughs> So now, Sentinels of the Multiverse is the superhero game without an IP. It doesn't have a home, but it has outstanding mechanics. It's, it's a lot of fun. You'll pick a hero. You'll have a deck of cards that's unique to your hero. You'll be fighting the villain, and you'll also be fighting slash benefiting from a unique environment. You'll kind of tag up together as a team. What's unique about it, it, it actually has a story. From each different expansion, it kind of grows the story about these superheroes fighting against these supervillains in a cosmic world, in a world in which time and space change radically. You know, you have alternate versions. You know, if you can weather a little bit of the artwork, you're really going to love Sentinels of the Multiverse. Yeah, another great game. Um, People often pick this as an alternative to DC Deck Builder, which I don't think is quite right. It's a different kind of game. It's not a Deck Builder or anything like that, but it is a wonderful superhero game. Number eight, Battle Lore 2.0. Now, Battle Lore is a two-player game You're fighting as the humans, or you're fighting as the monstrous evil, and you have these characters which you'll place out on your side of the board. It's it's got that module type of board where you can kind of put these pieces together. You'll be able to issue orders to your troops to move forward, to, to attack. Each of the different troops have a special ability. You'll be able to have magic in the game that will cause special effects to happen. It's a light tactical war game that pretty much anybody can play. Number seven, War of the Ring, second edition, or the collector's edition if you can afford it. Now, War of the Ring plays the Lord of the Rings epic fantasy. So you can play as the Sauron's forces and the darkness spreads, 
or you can play as Frodo in the Fellowship, trying to move closer towards Mordor and victory. It's quite thematic. The artwork is outstanding. The miniatures are of good quality. It's a little bit of a long game, and it's a two-player game, but it's, it's a great game and a lot of fun. Number six, Rune Wars. Rune Wars is part of the Battle Lord 2.0 version universe. So you have your elves, you have your humans, you have your undead, you have your bestial creatures. Basically, it seems like a risk type of game where you're trying to take out the other troops, but you're going to go after runes in this game. It has a lot of different troops, they have different abilities, you're spreading out, you have heroes which you'll pick up during the game. The heroes will go on their own quest, they'll add their strength and their abilities to you to fight against the other forces. You'll be able to build in these different seasons that you build out. It's quite a long game, but it's an epic game. It's really well worth your time. Number five, Small World. It's a small world after all. I hope we don't get sued. <laughs> I thought we promised Anthony we wouldn't do that. Yeah, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> TM. Uh, small World is a fantastic game. Uh, it's incredibly flexible in the way that powers are paired, right? Th- through the sort of modifiers and the races, you get all sorts of interesting combinations. Uh, and it is just one of the best area control games out there. There's, again, very little to say about this game that we didn't say not too long ago, but oh, two weeks ago. Um, but this is a fantastic game. Number four, Caverna. Uh, Caverna is the worker placement game I actually like. Uh, which is a lot for me. I liked Agricola all right. I could tolerate it. Caverna, I actively enjoyed. It is an amazing game. It is, I think, the single best worker placement game that has ever been created. Uh, And I think it has supplanted Agricola as the sort of master of that category. There is just not a game that can compete with it in its category. Number three, Bruges. Bruges is a Stefan Feld classic game, a modern classic, a recent classic, because... It is a Euro game that's a little bit on the lighter side. It plays a number of people. And what you're doing is you're building a little bit of a tableau. So you're building houses. You're putting people in the houses. You're triggering special abilities. You're building canals. You're dealing with threats. Sounds heavy. Sounds complex. But it's actually a lot of fun. And it's a good entry-level game for people who aren't those hardcore Euro players. You're trying to get people into Feld. It's a good place to start. It's it's a Feld, man. you got to play Feld. Number two... Seven Wonders. Uh, Seven Wonders is a fantastic game, and if there were Seven Wonders of the board game world, Seven Wonders would have a good shot at being in there. Uh, This is, again, one of the first games I played. In fact, the first game I played with Chris and with the podcast uh, crew as a whole, and it was just a great time. It's very simple to learn, very simple to play, science all the way, and you'll (laughs) win, so don't worry about it. Uh, but it is, it's a very good game, and there's a lot of variability in what you can do. And there are different strategies that work. It's just I keep winning every time I play straight science. So, Unless, unless somebody else goes science, too. Then it, that's a bit of a problem. It does muck up your day a little bit. And Seven Wonders has some recent expansions, so you can play cities. You can play leaders. Both play great. I prefer leaders a little bit more, but Sphinx is really interesting. And the recent Babel expansion kind of makes it a little bit more of a board game, but... Man, Seven Wonders plays with a lot of people, plays the same. You don't have to worry or stress out about it not scaling right. And, ah, man, there's so much goodness to Seven Wonders. Yeah, it's essentially the definitive card drafting tableau building game. And our number one game? (laughs) Defenders of the Realm. That was supposed to be Thunder, guys. I think that that probably didn't come across. But it was supposed to be like, you know, Crack of Thunder, Voice of Heaven. It didn't work. (laughs) Oh, that would have been yeah, way better. Yeah. Oh. Well, now you sound like an emergency message on TV. <laughs> this is a test. This is just a test of your Board Gamers Anonymous emergency alert system. This is only a, a, a test. test. <laughs> Had this been a real board game related emergency, you would have. Re- I'm sorry, guys. We're... But yeah, Defenders of the Realm is an awesome game. I think it has a very good claim in number one. There are a few other games that might challenge it up here. But it is totally fantastic. It is my favorite cooperative game, and I am a cooperative game guy. That is, that is sort of my style of gaming, my preferred style of gaming. Uh, it is just complex enough to make the gameplay interesting every time, even for the sort of more experienced players. 
And it's complex enough to really hinder the alpha gamer problem. Because if you can sit at the table and play this game, you're a gamer. Uh, and you don't need anyone telling you what to do. And also, there's so much stuff to keep track of about your own side of the board that you really don't have time to be going around and moving everybody else's pieces for them. So let me take this on the other side. I'm not a cooperative gamer. I, I like co-op games a little bit. But this is my number one also because Defenders does something very right in that you do have that cooperative we're all together at the table and honestly while competitive games are a lot of fun there is some feeling about when you're all playing together for a common goal that makes the experience so much better and yet as Daniel was saying you don't have that alpha gamer problem you have your own special abilities and talents you have your own quests which you're going on you can talk about strategy and how you're going to fight back the forces of evil to keep them away from Monarch City. But nonetheless, you can kind of go on and do your own thing. And your character plays like your character, which is a lot of fun. It's asymmetrical in that because, you know, the wizard can teleport around, throw fireballs. The druid can heal the land. The rogue can sneak behind and, and cause damage. It's just... There's so much to love about this game. The expansions with the additional heroes are great because now you can really play any D&D campaign you've ever wanted to play in a board game version. There's a dragon expansion that makes the game harder. There's special ability cards that you can add to this game. The artwork is nice. It has a simple pandemic mechanic to it as far as how the evil comes out and spreads. And yet at the same time, it plays different enough from a pandemic that... When you sit down, you're like, you don't think about Pandemic at all with this game. Yeah, I mean, I think the ultimate testament to this game is, uh, goes back to the first time I played it. We were down at Gamer's Gambit, the late, great Gamer's Gambit, with some really nice folks, and we were playing through this game. Uh, and we're usually a pretty quiet group when we play games, contrary to our on-air personas. We like to be respectful of the people around us, right? And this was a full day. Uh, and we got down to the final roll to kill one of the bosses, and we... After throwing everything at it, right, we had pulled three or four cards from up our sleeve to throw them on the table. The final roll comes down, we take it down, we get the hit, we kill the bad guy, and we erupt. Yes. <laughs> we stopped the entire store with how much we were celebrating. And I totally lost track of it. Like, I totally didn't catch myself doing that. I was that genuinely excited, right? This was the 90-yard... Uh, touchdown. This was amazing. And if a game can build up that kind of tension, that's something truly remarkable. This is an outstanding game. It's a credit to the industry. You know, I don't know what else that can be said about this game because it's something in which it incorporates so many elements from the other games we've been talking about on this episode that... Only by playing it can you truly understand and appreciate the greatness of this game. And it's just a wonderful experience. Yeah, it, it's a truly wonderful game that Chris got me for Christmas. So fall, or, you know, Winter Festival, what have you. <laughs> or Hanukkah. Yeah, I'm not really, I'm not, yeah, Hanukkah would be more appropriate for me. <laughs> or Christmas. Christmas or Christmas, or it's both. A, it's a Christmas gift to your Hanukkah. Christmas Hanukkah wants to go? That's true too. Festivus? Festivus. For the rest of us. For the rest of us. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> So that was our top 50 games, and thank you for joining us on this special episode and for joining us in all those previous 49 episodes in the past and for the hopefully 100 more to come in the future. Check us out on Board Game Geek, on Facebook, on Twitter, on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. You know, text us, email us, find us in the middle of the night and ask us to play a game. We'd love to hear from you. We enjoy the first 50, and we're looking forward to the next 50 you know, spread the word, go on iTunes, go on Stitcher, rate us so that other people can find us and we can spread the gospel of good gaming. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great time, been a great ride. And, uh, thanks for having us with you. This is Chris. And this is Daniel. And until next time, we will always save you a seat at our number one spot. 